Jum <laughs> Chodo jazo je ho dumba jumde de de je je wa ta jumba ya da wa zo be san je je wa da ja zo de wa ra je wa je de jam ba je wo de we ka lo je wa na me ba la da me na je dumba san je jumde de pe ja wa ja ja do wa Chodo <laughs> Lama da gombo jizun jambe ya cha ze lo e kange o e lo te te nye o e te nte nye da e nam da rab ze we che nye o e dun kwe che che o e se che nye je o e do ka Leg Bama in Zen Kandai Zebe Zerai Mari Mendoma and Donye Gizebe Trozo Guela Poje Daze and Troje Yande Song. Cho darai je cho nye mo e nye lo e le je e cha do e tu ze che ma ri o e me se to nye o e nye go e che nye o e che ze ra te nam te ne o e da je Saju 
O mara bazana da 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 o mara o mara bazana di 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 Kada dinci jolu doba ye loce bobe nava ze doy soy. Pöge cüce me do cama şeca leşe nende gembande. Sanje jendo meyde doba ye çoku namda jen çöbara şoy. Nama damba ye nama ge çögü kala genze cendene Cedara zambe döce zemala Zavge cöge caba dosu Rana mendala gana ya daya me ay Sange cödan soge çonama Çakçı bado dane cazo çe, dage çöşe gebe sonama ge, cola bence zange cobara şoy, sange çıdan soge çonama la. Çakçı bado dane cazo çe, dage çöşe gebe sonama ge, Bence sanje cobara şoy, sanje çıdan soge çonama la, çangcı bado dane cazo çe, dage çöşe gibi sonama, cola bence sanje cobara şoy. Good morning. We were going, we were getting ready to pack and go home. <laughs> ah, yeah. I'm sure people are alive. Yeah, I see, I, I don't see. Yeah, the usuals. Mm. Maybe they have some aversion towards Guru Yoga. <laughs> So how was your week? Good week? Yes. Mm. I find mind mindfulness practice is very good. Mm. Help your mind to kind of give that time to respond and to do the most kind. Yes, yes. The only thing is we forget to be mindful. Right. Uh, if we are able to really adopt that mindfulness all the time, perfect. Mm -hmm. Things will go much, much better mm -hmm. in every field. There were many countless occasions where we regret, oh, I shouldn't have done that, I shouldn't have said that. It's all because we were not mindful. We just react and then, yeah, we regret. So the best way, as I suggested before, is every morning try to adopt. 
Recently, I had an incident. I failed. Anger. I won't go into detail. There was an occasion where, but I was mindful most of the time. But there was tiny instance, tiny moment where I was very angry. And then, yeah, I stopped the car. Then I spoke to the person. What's going on? Why are you scolding me all the time? Did, was your day bad? Are you just showing anger because something went wrong with you? But all the time I was able to really restrain. But just that first moment, there was this anger, and that really destroyed my peace of mind. I was worried all the time. It was there was something lingering there. It's just that I think wasn't able to do. So the damage, just an instant of anger, when they say that it will destroy your peace of mind, you can see that really, really, and that discomfort that lingered for a while. So when that happened, the subsequent days I was consciously consciously making that resolve that whatever may be the instances, circumstances, whatever circumstances it may be, may I never lose my patience. But don't try me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think that's helpful. Sometimes when we have this kind of incidents, then it kind of wakes you up. And uh, sometimes, yeah, you have tried, but then, yeah, after a while, that what you call the intensity of awareness, intensity of resolve kind of declines. And then when you encounter such incidents, then, yeah, you, you became more determined and you realize that you still need to practice. You still need to adopt that strong determination. So that only happens when you see the fault. We, because we study, we have been going through Shanti Deva's uh, patience chapter, so we know the anger is not good. But how many people are aware of that? They flare in anger, that's it. And if they accomplish something, maybe they are quite, what you call, uh, uh, this, this proud that I accomplished this. Well, sometimes you need to be angry. Yeah, yeah. That's what they think. But actually it is not. I should have actually looked for that. There's an episode, I think the Friends, the TV series. Have you seen those? It's all famous, isn't it? Yes. There was a scene where Ross, he thought that, yeah, anger is so useful. So he used that. And he, he first he felt, wow, everybody is respecting him. Actually realized that everybody hates him because of his <laughs> anger. Because everybody just give in, you see. Right. So he thought, that, oh, this is the way, you see, to adopt. Then he realized that it was not. Hmm. I Can watch I all this. Uh. How do you? I feel like I have trouble dealing with more like it's not so much, it's sort of anger, but it's more like irritation. Like yeah. I watch yeah. my mind mostly at work mm. with clients that mm. are challenging mm. to work with. My correspondence with them is professional. Mm. Like I would not yell at a client yeah, or yeah, at, you know, say yeah. anything inappropriately. Mm. But in my mind, there's this irritation of <laughs> yeah, yeah, why yeah. is this client doing this or you yeah, know yes, how do yes. you do that? And that's harder to try to stop that. So like outwardly, yes, I'm yes, fine. But uh, in my mind, there's just yeah. this level of irritation. No, it's not no. quite anger, but it's, yes. Yeah. I mean, that's very good actually. Irritation is, I would say, better than outbursts because it develops, isn't it? Irritation then frustration, and then, yeah, outburst comes. So it is good that you are able to really notice that from that, what you call the, the uh, nascent stage, is it? When it is 
rising, you are able to really catch it. But uh, most people who are unaware of this, uh, what you call the disadvantages of anger and all this thing, there were no, uh, what you call, stages. Just boom, isn't it? Like this. But in your case, it's good that or you realize that oh, there's this agitation coming. And then you have the choice. Should I come down or, you know, let it, uh, what do you call, uh, what is the word now? Let it manifest. Let it blossom <laughs> into a beautiful <laughs> thing. Yeah, it's up to you. Yeah, I think uh, that is very common. Irritation, of course, we are still ordinary people. There is irritation. But the fact is that you are able to apply break and hold it there and not let it rise. That itself, I would say, is a big accomplishment, which not many people don't even realize. So don't feel bad. It, that's it, that's yes, common. It's yeah, it, it, of course, of course. Outwardly, yeah. Outwardly, yeah. Appropriately, mm. inwardly, it's like the irritation stays. Mm. You know? Yeah, that's, 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 I think, I think it's common. Mm. Don't you think it's common? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I still have my many, many moments, but I think I've become better as I work on it mm. at preventing the outburst. Yeah. Mm. And um, yeah, years ago, before I started the Dharma, I mm. just, just got angry. And now mm. the, the outward manifestation doesn't always help. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes, yes, it is, it is. That's very good. Yeah, these are the things, a Dharma practitioner, these are things that should happen to Dharma practitioner, isn't it? So you come to Dharma classes, and you will, you know, like that kind, and then after repeatedly attending classes and all this thing, then when you look back, oh, you see that, oh, okay, even though the improvements the progress for incremental, at least there is a progress. If there is no progress at all, then yeah, <laughs> it is yeah something to be something to worry about. Mm. Way, uh, mm. I find that uh, if if I work with her, mm. and also working with other people, mm. if I look at what's making me angry, it's mm. that um, I have an attachment. Mm. to either how I want it done mm. or the outcome or the mm. process. Mm. And when I um, am able to release that attachment, mm. then I just don't care. Yeah. So I don't have yeah. to get angry. Yes. But I also have to guard against teasing my spouse mm. when I mm. see her mm. because she has a, 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 a love of anger. She thinks mm. anger is a good thing. Mm. So then I'll, mm. I'll start Teasing her, <laughs> and I think it's funny, but boy, you know. <laughs> but attachment for me, it's that yeah. that kind of that little root that is uh, yeah where it starts. Yeah, actually, yeah, you, you got it. You you really got the main thing. It all boils down to our attachment to our ego. Why we get angry is because our attachment to ego. How dare! He says this to me. How dare he treats me this way? How dare he refutes? How dare he resists? What I say is right. What I say should go. Then when there's a resistance or some protest you don't like, when they especially try to argue, or when it's like you're not having your way. So that affects you, isn't it? That affects us. That's why we are, yeah, we, are, we get angry. Okay, so now today we are not going to talk about anger. We are going to talk about something else. Ganden Lajama. Lama Tsongga Ba. Lama Tsongga Pass. Pass. Guru Yoga. So, what do you know about Guru Yoga? What do you understand as Guru Yoga? It's the root practice for development on the path. To recognize that all the teachings 
and therefore all of our progress comes from the guru, mm -hmm. and we have to show uh, utmost respect mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. acknowledgement of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So first question is, do you have a root guru? Because if you don't have any guru at all, so what are you going to do? You know, how are you going to practice guru yoga practice, isn't it? So the first thing is you need to have a, a guru. Only then, yeah, if you have uh, what you call taking somebody as your guru, that also root guru, you may have several gurus. But from there, you can choose one as a root guru. But it doesn't mean that others you should ignore. But normally it says that, you know, uh, when you do the visualization, uh, you have to choose one. So how do we choose one? All looks equally <laughs> important, isn't it? Well, I, I guess uh, I've uh, heard and read sometimes that the, the teacher who was giving you the most important initiations and teachings is the root guru. Mm. Um, also... Mm. Um, I had no teachers for most of my life, and all of a sudden, I have, mm. have now have and have had mm. several, mm. and um, I feel a very close connection to many of them. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I, I, you know, I, I got to the point where I thought, well, it's not super important as long as I'm um, basing and that close connection to this one particular Lama, but uh, one or two others also that I, I, I don't I don't think I can exclude them from my practice mm. really. Yeah, yeah, no need to exclude. No need all yeah you can uh, visualize there. But as a main so I think I think I'm not wrong if I say that. So from uh, those who have whom, from whom you have received tantra initiations, especially highest yoga, I think that one comes first. And then if you have many of those, many of those, then yeah, you have to see whom has benefited you the most. That, that is the kind of formula here. Mm. From sutra to tantra, tantra is most important. And then if you are equally, you have received, let's say you have two lamas uh, whom you have received highest yoga uh, initiation. And then among these two, you see whom you feel that you have benefited the most. Mm. 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 Yeah, you can still. If... Uh, your guru is no longer alive, and if you don't have any other root guru, you can still, uh, 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 what do you call, do the meditation. That's what uh, uh, Milarepa, Milarepa's Lama Marpa passed away a long time ago, but he still calls Lama and does all the practices inseparable of his uh, guru Marpa. So, yeah. To answer Bonnie's question, yes, you can still, if you don't have any other, you can just continue uh, doing the practice or whatever. Continue uh, treating that person as your root guru. Mm. So, what is, so my slides may be, so now I think it's a, uh, why is this Guru Yoga so important? I think as uh, Ken mentioned that it is the foundation of all good qualities. It's like in order for one to really uh, attain something, some realization, no realization comes about without relying on one's Guru. So this is what 
Manjushiri directly uh, told Lama Tsongkhapa when he was doing all that, uh, studying and trying to contemplate and meditate and to gain realization. So there, were, there was a time where Lama Tsongkhapa felt that he's not progressing. He has done intensive reading, extensive meditation, but still he's not getting the finer points, the f not getting the real, uh, what you call the truth, the realizing that, that especially the emptiness is not get, getting the real understanding of the uh, emptiness. So when Lama Tsongkhapa kind of complained this to Manjushiri, this is what Manjushiri's advice is. Concentrate on a combination of three things regarding his guru as inseparable, regarding your guru as inseparable from your meditation deity. So this is where it comes, the Guru Yoga. And petitioning his guru, working hard at building up uh, your accumulation and purifying the obscurations and pursuing the visualizations that are cause for liberation. So there are three things. The main is that you need to practice this Guru Yoga. You need to see your Guru inseparable of any practice. So we do all kinds of practice. We do Yamantaka practice. We do that sadhana. We do Heruka sadhana. We do, I don't know, Kala Chakra, all this. But if we view all this deity separate from your own root guru, then it is not a real guru, what do we call the deity yoga practice. So whatever we do, we must combine, we must bring uh, your devotion and uh, uh, guru yoga into that. So the reason why Manjushiri suggested this is that, of course, the main is we need to accumulate enough merits to really support our understanding and realization. And also we need to, uh, what do you call, clear that obscuration, whatever obstacles or hindrance that is blocking our understanding or our realization, achieving that realization. So the most powerful way to do this too, to accumulate merit and to purify, is through Guru Yoga practice. Because Guru is the most powerful object of uh, even your uh, offerings or prostrations or whatever you do in relation to your Guru. That becomes very powerful. In sutras, Buddha has repeatedly mentioned that even if you were to make offerings to countless Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, it will be really, really meritorious. The merit you one can accrue from that will be limitless. But it says that if you compare that to the offerings made to your Guru, it is very tiny when it is compared to that. So this shows that how powerful our practices or offerings in relation to uh, our Guru. So in the found, in foundation of good qualities, the foundation of good qualities is the kind and perfect pure Guru. Correct devotion to Him is the root of path. By clearly seeing this and applying great effort, please bless me to rely upon him with great respect. So you you though you have already studied Lamrim. The Lamrim begins actual topic begins with the Guru devotion, relying on Guru, how to rely. This is because that Guru is the foundation of good qualities. So even in conventional sense, 
your education begins at school. If your teacher, if there is no teacher to teach you, you won't be able to gain all that skills and knowledges for, for, for you to cope with the life's difficulty. So even in conventional sense, we know that teachers are very important. But then, of course, when it comes to spiritual uh, field, it is not about this life. We are talking about uh, what do you call establishing uh, a great future. So that one, yeah, we really need to rely on guru. So my slides today is a bit, uh, what you call, kind of haphazard. I didn't have the time to really go through it. So bear with me. And <laughs> uh, So in order for, in order to do an effective guru yoga practice, first we need to have the what is this actually coming from? Oh, mm, this is not what I wanted to talk about now. Okay, I will do this later. Maybe this. Okay. So. So we need to first establish this relationship with a spiritual teacher. And I'm not going into detail, but first we need to look for a teacher. Not any teacher is not enough. You need to find what is called a qualified teacher. So if you go into Lamrim, there are uh, defining characteristics of a teacher. So you need to look for all these qualities before you establish your relationship. That's why in Lamrim or everywhere it is kind of reiterated or emphasized that, you know, don't be hasty in establishing this relationship. And uh, sometimes what happens is people like to chase those with names, those who have some uh, fame. And then they say, oh, I want it, oh, is my guru and all this thing. And then, yeah, later, maybe not too long, and they will start to see faults and start to criticize. That's very dangerous. So that's why we need to be very, very careful before establishing. And I have mentioned before that I think in Tibet, I think it was a long time ago, there was no question that, you know, when you attend a class, when you receive even one word of teaching, that's it. Either you don't go, or if you go, then that person becomes your teacher. But uh, after the Buddhism started to go in the West, and then lamas became very kind. Yeah, sometimes, yeah, people don't realize this. Is lamas were very kind to accommodate because they know that the, the, the what do you call it, people other than Tibetan don't have that kind of mentality. So they were trying to what do you call accommodate their inclination. So they relax so many things. And uh, sometimes people don't realize this and they think that, oh, this is the way. That's not the way. But lamas have been very kind. They were accommodated. But you know that when Lama Subarambaji come, yeah, there's no such excuses. Very traditional. Either you follow or not follow. But many lamas have been very kind. They will just relax so many things. And uh, so because of that, now there is kind of a, a two views. 
the, the liberal or conservative view, that, which I always talk about. The liberal is, you don't have to take somebody as your guru when you attend class. You check. You attend the class. After you really, you know, think that you are ready and the person has all the qualities that you are looking for, only then you kind of establish. So that's, in a way, it's very good. Then people have chance to gauge the other person. So that's why, that's what we are following. So I don't treat you that we already have this establishment. We don't have to, even though you have been coming for class, because I subscribe to that liberal view, <laughs> which, which is good, which is good. So what I'm trying to point here is that it is so important to really check, double check, the person whom you are going to establish. Because it is like signing a big deal. If you don't do that, then what happens is there are consequences. There are ramifications which are quite risky. Sometimes in the West, they think that this guru devotion is something Tibetan lamas made up. That's why I'm bringing some quotes. These are from sutras. It's not that Tibetan lamas made up. Here it says, in short, attaining and bringing to completion all the bodhisattva deeds, and likewise attaining and bringing all this, guru increases them. They depend upon the guru. The guru is their cause. This is Lama Atisha saying. Lama Atisha is not a Tibetan. Lama Atisha is an Indian scholar. Geshe Dum Dumba said to Atisha, in Tibet there are many who are meditating and practicing, yet they are not attaining any special good qualities. The elder said, all the significant and insignificant good qualities that pertain to the Mahayana arise from relying on a guru. You Tibetans only think of guru as being common persons. How can good qualities arise? Then again, when someone asks the elder in a loud voice, so this is another story. So basically, Lama Adisha was also saying, highlighting the importance of guru devotion to weaving your guru as a Buddha. So I think what Lama Adisha said here has a very important, uh, what do you call, implication, or made a very poignant is it, point. Because in the West, and nowadays, everywhere, there are so many great scholars. Even those who are Westerners, they went to India, they studied the Tibetan language. They are so good, well-versed, great scholars. You ask any question, they can answer. But how many have really attained any realization? Of course, we cannot judge. We don't know the inner qualities, but it doesn't look that way, isn't it? <laughs> well, you just have to poke them a little bit and you see that the echo comes in. They cannot. They must argue. That shows that there is no realization. So I'm just thinking that maybe this is the case. Because many in the West, many kind of brush aside, oh, Guru devotion, you don't need to do that. So that's why when I started Lamrim, I didn't teach Guru Devotion. It's a bit touchy here, especially when I'm sitting and teaching. It's like sometimes people misinterpret that I'm asking you to, you know, devote to me. Not at all. I'm just saying this is what the teaching says, isn't it? I remember Angkor Thupu mm. sharing his teaching, so mm. the very same thing. Mm. Yeah. It just 
just about every teaching group I've had said that. They mm. all been very careful to say that. All yeah. Of them. <laughs> yeah. Because they know that in the West, it's very touchy. It's very touchy. Many think that it's a cultural thing. I always say that, yes, there is some element of cultural thing, but Tibetan culture itself is influenced by Buddhism. Because of all this Dharma thing, Tibetan culture is built on. Tibetan culture itself is built on Dharma. So many of the things are accordance to Dharma. So it, you cannot just, you know, kind of, kind of brush aside, oh, that's a cultural thing. And I think recently I came across, I think it's from, if I'm not mistaken, there's a Berzin, what's that, his name? Alexander I think there's something like that. We don't need to take literally the teaching that says that uh, we have to view see Guru as Buddha. Maybe I misunderstood. But all the text says, so that's why what I find is, I hope it is okay to say here, sometimes, yeah, people, these scholars, so-called scholars, they really try to interpret according to their understanding their view, their inclination, how they feel. So they always find a way, and that's why it's so diluted. Buddhism is very rich, so they dig down all whatever is, you know, they feel uncomfortable. They just, okay, remove this, this is the cultural thing, this we don't need to do, all this. And then in the end, what do we have? Nothing there. In the 1960s, there was a phenomenon called uh, cults, mm. and a lot of people kind of were brainwashed by, I think, people posing as teachers, as mm. spiritual teachers, mm. not Buddhism, but mm. and a lot of people, I, I think that's in the back of maybe a lot of e. mm. in, in the back of the minds of many Westerners. Yeah, e. yes. Yes. So anyway, so this is what the text says. So you can see that the, there, there are many quotations in the, I think we will later come. I didn't want to bring all. You see, this is one. Once you have taken somebody as your guru, then how you should view your that spiritual teacher. So this is in the sutra. Tantra bestowing the initiation of Vajrapani. I think it's Tibetan Lana Dojo Wonguwe Do or something. Gyu or Do something. So in this it says, if you would ask, O Lord of Secrets, how disciples should view masters then I would answer that they should view them just as they view the Bhagavan. If the disciples view their masters in this way, they will always cultivate virtues. They will become Buddhas and benefit the entire world. And then this, this is, and then asked Bhagavan, what sort of fru fruition is there for those who reproach their masters? The Bhagwan answered, Vajrapani, do not ask this question, for the answer will frighten the world, including the deities. You see, it is so severe that, that hearing the answer would scare everybody, would frighten, terrify everybody. So he says, as I have explained, any of the unbearable hells resulting from such karma as the deed of immediate retribution are said to be the abode of those who reproach their teachers. They must stay there for limited eons. Therefore, never reproach your master on any occasions. So these are mentioned in sutras. 
not made by Tibetan lamas. <laughs> It's a very difficult proposition because you can't help but see uh, the, the things that you teach and your master does, mm. and some of them do not appear as enlightened activities. I don't mm. see that you can't still see your teaching as mm. that you can. But there's this contradiction because uh, objectively you can see that someone is, who's teaching maybe is not. Mm. Where there are uh, little things that they're not teaching, mm. moments of irritation, um, moments of bias, or whatever, whatever it happens to mm. be. Mm. Um, and this becomes a very difficult thing because you just can't. I know that I still want to view my, my lama as a, as a guru, but there there is this real. Reality <laughs> to the situation. So, mm. you know, that, that's it's different. You know, that's something that, that requires mm. some, yeah, well, uh, for lack of a better word, some dancing to accommodate. Mm. Yeah. So it is not easy to view because we are we are so ordinary. Our view is so ordinary. So that's why we have difficulty, even if. Buddha himself appears. Let, let, let's talk about during Buddha's time. There's no question that Buddha is enlightened being. That means Buddha is faultless. But when Buddha was alive, there are still people who see him as the embodiment of fault, who is the aggregate of all the errors, faults. So when you see that, mm, you can understand. A Buddha who is an enlightened being can be seen by people as all fault instead of seeing flawless as all fault. What can you expect? And then Buddha, when the Buddha, what do you call the the the, the historical Buddha, he manifested as Buddha. But our teachers, they did not manifest as Buddha. They manifest as ordinary. So let's say if you are acting as a villain in a movie, you have to act as a villain, isn't it? <laughs> if you are acting as a very kind person, you have to act as a kind person. But it's the same person. But because you are acting like a villain, you cannot say that, oh, he has all these faults of this girl. We don't know. And my mother gets very confused. She, she, when she watches Indian TV series, there's something called Crime Patrol. So this is, a, uh, I think it's a weekly or I don't know, there's this short, short episodes. But it looks like they have limited actors. So the one person will be in one uh, story, that person will be uh, acting as a villain. In another, he will be acting as inspector. So there were times where my mother said, how come he's still alive? He died yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is, you see, they are taking different roles. And what really helps us is that, what is the purpose of Buddha? Why Buddha worked so hard to become enlightenment? It is to liberate us to help us. So when Buddha came, we were still left behind. And uh, if Buddha were to come in that, what do you call the Nirmana Kaya form, only who can see them? Only those Arya beings. No, some Boga Kaya, sorry. Some Boga Kaya, isn't it? The enjoyment body. Yeah, enjoyment body. Of course, Dhammakaya is the state of mind. No way we will be able to see and receive teachings. And then Sambhogakaya, we call enjoyment body. That is only 
can be seen by Arya beings, especially the Bodhisattva Arya beings, not even the uh, hearer or solitude realizes. They cannot even see. And it only stays in that, that uh, what you call this special uh, abode. No way. So in order to help the rest of us, Buddha came in the form of Nirmanakaya. That also we cannot fathom. We have difficulty. So now the only option is to come as our level, as ordinary person. His Holiness Dalai Lama, no doubt. I think in Tibetan, most of the Tibetans mind, no doubt that His Holiness is the emanation, is the Avalokiteshvara. But there are people, there are still people who are finding faults. And sometimes we say, oh, how come he's going to do that? Because he came as ordinary person. He has to act as ordinary. He gets sick. He, he gets old. If His Holiness comes as generous himself, then of course there will be no aging, there will be no falling sickness, enlightened, what do you call that? Everything is, uh, uh, what is that, omniscient. But when somebody comes in the form of ordinary person, has to manifest that same thing. So because of that, we cannot say that that is not enlightened being. First of all, our perception can be very deceiving. We know from our experience, three people looking at the same situation, same circumstance, everybody has a different explanation. Everybody sees differently. So because you see that, you cannot say that it is that. Isn't it? So that's why we need to train ourselves. At the moment, we have this, everything we see, fall, this and all. But through training, there will come a day that everything your Guru does, you will see as enlightened. Like there are many great Lamas, when they mention about their Guru, you can see that automatically they will do this. And some, at the mention of their Lama, tears just roll down. This shows that they have developed that kind of faith. And there was a story, there's one story that I think it was Tijan Rinpoche. When Tijan Rinpoche, there was a Lama uh, Rinpoche was, Tijan Rinpoche was attending a teaching. That was when Tijan Rinpoche was young. So he was given, because it's Tijan Rinpoche, he was given extra cushion there. So Lama was teaching. And he was seated there despite his uh, protest. So it is said that the whole session, that, that young Rinpoche was crying, crying. Because to him, it is such a disrespectful to sit on an extra elevated kind of a uh, throne in front of his own guru. So the whole session was crying. That these kind of things will only happen when we are able to really uh, train our mind and to see that. Mm. I understand that and I find my best to do that. And I, you know, unfortunately, we have two pieces of conduct in the world who's been, in my mind. Mm. No, your uh, own teacher. Let's not talk about other teacher. Yeah. 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 Mm. But I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, in other sanghas, there have been cases in the West like uh, uh, Trungpa Rinpoche, you know, that sexual misconduct, mm. drinking, and so on. And mm. Things where a lot of people felt harmed. Mm. They had a lot of faith in him. Mm. And um, you can talk about crazy verse and lamas and all that sort of thing. And yet, um, in the face of, of something like this, how how would you go about seeing your lama as faultless and perfect? Mm. You know, how would you do that? Mm. I don't personally have this problem. I know other people have. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. 
So it, it is mainly about developing this pure view to your own guru. The others, you look here, look there, they are not your own guru. That's a different thing. And also, whatever they are being reported, all this thing, were you there? How accurate that is. People were, I'm not saying that is wrongly accused. There is a possibility that maybe there is more to this. Maybe there is a purpose to it. When, uh, when Miller Rebbe and Marba's story, you know, how cruel, if you don't see the intention, you will be the how cruel Lama Marba is. How could we do this to anybody, let alone that poor boy? Remember how strict he was. He asked him to build that, that building. When he built, he gave the instruction, he says, that, who told you to do this? I didn't tell you to build this way. Remove everything. Put everything back to where you have taken. All the rocks from where you have carried, all the soil from where you have and then he said, build me this one, give a new design. You build that. I says, who told you this to? So when you look at this, it's like, how come? Not even, let alone our teacher or spiritual master, even ordinary people wouldn't do this. When we only look from one perspective, what we see is that, how come? But then, as the story develops, we know that why all this was necessary. But Lama also know that he can persevere. He is the worthy student. That's why he thought that because he has done so much uh, non-virtue in this life itself, need to purify all that. So we don't know. It is very difficult to say that, you know, Absolutely to say, that, oh, it is his fault, he did this. We really don't know. So what I'm saying is, I'm not saying that, you know, this uh, whatever is reported is not true or anything. When you look at these things, you can help yourself by saying, that, oh, maybe there's more to this thing. There's maybe another thing. Instead of really buying into this, you give some, what you call, benefit of doubt. You just raise these questions. And then, remember, we, we talked about the Asanga. When Asanga did the retreat, so that Asanga could see, uh, what's, what's the name? The Maitreya. For nine years, went to the retreat, three years, hoping to have the vision. Came back, but then there was something that inspired him to go back. And again, again, after nine years, he still couldn't find it. And then, yeah, remember that 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 uh, maggot-ridden dog he saw outside the cave. And that, when he saw that, he this this generated automatically this strong compassion came over him, and he wanted to help. But the choice is, is if he were to wife pick the maggots, then maggots will die. If he, if he were to live there, the dog will die. So he cut his own flesh, put all the maggots on that one, and then help nurse the... In, 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 even lifting that, if he, he, if he were to do with his hand, it may kill. So he used his tongue. The moment he touched that, that dog, maggot ridden dog, disappeared. And in its place, who was there? Maitreya was there. So when Asanga asked Maitreya, how come for nine years I was in retreat to see you, but you never showed up? So he said, I was all the time there. Because you have so much delusion, so much negative karma there, 
that even I was there all the time, you weren't able to see. Now that because of your this act of compassion, you have purified the negativities that were created for many lifetimes. That's why you were able to see me. And uh, in order to prove that, so if you don't believe me, you carry me on your shoulder and walk around the city and tell people that I have Matria here. People thought that this, he was crazy because nobody could see. And he would say, hey, I have Matria on my shoulder. Come receive blessings. Everybody thought, oh, this guy, not kiss. <laughs> Only an elderly lady saw a corpse of a dog. Obviously, compared to the rest, she was more purified. So that why at least she could see. So this shows that we don't really see what is there. We are always blocked by. So this is another story where we can tell ourselves that, you know, Maybe it's not the Lama, my Guru have these faults. Maybe it's me, somehow, you know, seeing this. So, in Lamrim it says that, at the end, it says that, why you need to see Buddha as a uh, no, teacher, as Guru, is that, we all want profit, we all want, we all seek gain. We all do not want loss. If that is the case, that is the way. So if you are able to view that way, you don't lose anything. There is always gain. There is always benefit. So if you are a thinking person, why not do that? Why are you not bothered by all this? Just maintain your pure view. The more you are able to maintain that, you benefit. The more you benefit. No matter whatever it is, it could be the real fact they're happening, but if you are able to adopt that kind of view, it gives you peace of mind. It benefits you. Your practice improves. And then, yeah, without much effort, maybe you will be able to gain some realization. At the moment, I'm not saying you, yeah, including myself. We have this ordinary view of our guru. Because of that, there's no realization. Despite putting so much effort, nothing comes. That's why I remember it says, Nyena Tsignisin, Samna Thumyuko, Komna Gyulamige. That's what it says, meaning is that when you try to study and try to memorize something, as well, nothing gets in. And then it's okay, I'll let me just go and contemplate on this thing. Contemplate on it. Only sleep comes. Nothing really, you know, happens. And then it's okay, let me just do meditation. No matter how long you do, there is no realization. It is all because that we are, first of all, we are we have such a heavy negative karma that really kind of what do you call blocks everything it's kind of brings us sinks us down in that and then we have this view that you know viewing your guru ordinary ordinary so all these are problems so why i'm saying this is because in the in all the commentaries even in the lamrim chemo there is a one line it says that in all, I don't know whether I have this here or not. In all this context, Lama, what you call the Guru Yoga, no, maybe I don't have it here. Maybe I don't have it here. Basically, he's saying that all that Guru devotion, Lama, what you call, Guru Yoga and other thing. It must include the ways to devote to your gurus. If you leave that aside and then try to do a session on Guru Yoga, it says useless. 
because the essence is not there. You are supposed to view the Guru inseparable of Lama Tsongkhapa or even when you do a Shajimani Buddha Guru Yoga, supposed to you see as inseparable, but you don't have that view. So, of course, you are not going to benefit anything from that, isn't it? So, that's why I'm, so for, for the first session, I'm going to, that's why I'm talking about all this. Because I haven't talking about, I haven't spoken, or I haven't taught about, or let's say not taught, discuss about the Guru devotion topic at all. So, this is important if we are going to do the Guru Yoga. But with that, if you do Guru Yoga, is really good for happiness in this life, happiness in a future life, and also all that realization will happen. At the moment, sometimes we feel a bit discouraged. Come, you know, I've been studying and studying, doing my practice, but I feel that there's no improvement, there's no progress. It's all because of this. There's something is missing. Some ingredient, if we are to make, let's say, pasta, if you don't have the tomato sauce, isn't it? That pasta sauce, no matter whatever you put in, whatever you try, it will never become a pasta. <laughs> it won't taste, taste pasta, isn't it? The real ingredient is not there. Mm. Okay, let's stop here. This is funny, isn't it? He says, the more people I meet, the more I like my dog. <laughs> uh, I think enough. If I drink too much, then yeah, my bladder gets full. <laughs> and then it's like I have to end the class early. <laughs> Oh, to the chair. Oh, oh, to the chair. Tell you, maybe to the chair. Then you're going to talk to the chair. Yeah, yeah. question. Mm -hmm. um, my cousin uh, out in California has been diagnosed with cancer, and so at this mm -hmm. point, maybe mm -hmm. just has a few more months to live. Oh, so and, then, so. yeah. mm -hmm. and they're going out to visit mm -hmm. next weekend. Mm -hmm. But he has no spiritual. He's not Christian. He's not, you know, mm -hmm. no mm -hmm. spiritual inclination mm -hmm. at all. And mm -hmm. he 
you know, going out to visit them, and there's this part of me in the back of my mind, like, is there mm. anything extra I can do? I mean, mm. I know I can say prayers on my own, but mm. anything I can do when I'm with them, to create the tiniest little imprint mm. or something. Yeah. Well, you can ask him whether, you know, he wants, whether or he wants you to recite mm -hmm. some prayers. Mm -hmm. So if he shows an indi I mean indication, uh -huh. then, yeah, you can... Uh, Picture or yeah. anything. Yeah, first you need you have to ask, have to ask him yeah, whether, he's, yeah. whether he's open to this. Yeah. So if it's not open, then yeah, I think yeah you cannot do much. Yeah. But you can just try me. Anything I can do for you, mm -hmm. anything that can make you, uh, I don't know, more comfortable mm -hmm. with this kind of general question. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, it's difficult. Yeah, yeah. it's very mm. difficult. Yeah. yeah. But you never know when the people at that stage, yeah, mm -hmm. they may open. Right. They may open to because now they realize that there's nothing to hold on mm -hmm. to. So at least, mm -hmm. yeah, they may be willing to give it a try. Mm -hmm. You never know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Because at this point, uh, I mean, right now I just mainly correspond with them by text, and we don't have a lot in common. But the one thing we do is we both enjoy nature, and so he oh. heard that he's just like he's not. He's spending a lot of his time just on his phone, mm -hmm. you know, looking at pictures. Mm -hmm. So I'll send him some pretty. Like oh, nature pictures, I like here with fall I colors see. or something, oh, and I, I and I know he likes that, but that's oh, like the only way okay. I've been able to connect yeah, with yeah, him. Yeah. You know? oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And of course, the important thing is at the time to be comfortable. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So make sure. I mean, his wife's taking care of him. He's oh, okay. right now. His okay. wife and son are so yeah. taking care of him. So the most important is to what do you call that? Check care of the unfinished business. Yeah. Yeah. That will give him a peace of mind. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And I think he's trying to do that from a practical level because he's been the one that's, mm -hmm. you know, worked. His wife's been a stay at home mom. Oh, I see. You know, so I know that he's trying to take care of all the practical stuff oh, okay. to make sure his wife and son are oh, okay. taken care of good, good. Okay. when he goes. So he's trying right. to, he's very responsible in okay. that way. Yeah, just yeah, trying good. to take if care of all If you're able to do that, at least he can be on a kind of way. I mean, I would call it, uh, yeah, go in peace. Yeah. 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 All right. Thank you. <laughs> All the best. <laughs> yeah. It's hard. It's like so with Jocelyn this year and then my cousin mm. and David's parents last year. There's just been yeah. a lot. David had a few friends from high school that have died from cancer in the last like two, three years. Mm. It just seems like a lot. Yeah. Mm. Okay. <laughs> so can we eat this bread? Um, I'm not sure because sometimes I don't know if it has like any butter in it. Oftentimes oh, there I might see. be. You so can ask. this is very good. Oh, is it? You can ask them. Yeah, whether there's any. Mm. Yeah. Okay. This is very good. Tasty. Oh, okay. mm. Yeah, when we buy bread at the store, we always have to look at the ingredients, mm. or sometimes they'll like put like baste it with mm. egg on top. So. Oh, I so see. Have to look. <laughs> so you cannot eat any cake then. Uh, not normal cake, but th there's rest vegan recipes that you can do with like egg vegan replacer. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Mm. So we make, or there's a vegan bakery in Minneapolis mm. that does cakes and cupcakes. That oh, vegan, so. but does it taste the same? It's good. Yeah, we got some vegan cupcakes recently. Oh, okay. <laughs> I like cupcakes. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, you must ask. This is really good. Oh, okay. Mm. <laughs> so I'll check. Mm.
we really don't need it, do we? Hmm? With this small group, we really don't need it. Do it. <laughs> Sometimes it comes because you have no choice. Right. Sometimes it happens because you just have such a bad choice. Yeah. 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 How is that work, Ken? Your work? How is that work? Oh, it's good. It's mm -hmm. good. I'm working for a new company now. Mm. That's a uh, very, very good group of people mm. and very interesting work. Oh, okay. So those, there's usually three things mm. uh, because I do a lot of contracting. So mm -hmm. I go from one company to the next, oh, okay. and I find there's three, three major characters. Mm. Is that affect how we, I enjoy my work, and mm. it's one is the people. Mm. If the people are friendly and yeah, 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 and, yeah. You know, intelligent, mm. the second is the actual work you do, mm. whether or not mm. it's interesting. Mm. I think, Ken, you also maybe had the same experience as an engineer. Mm. And then the third thing is um, how much you're paid. Mm. So mm. you never get all... Yeah, 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 yeah. You have to compromise. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> mm, okay. But the current one is very good for okay. all three. Oh, that's good. I'm happy. Mm. 
Mm. So is it uh, near your place? Well, yeah. it's oh. I actually work out of my home. Oh. So the, the company is in Colorado. Oh, okay. They make, okay. Uh, they make something for microchips or for semiconductor mm. manufacturing. Mm. Oh, okay. Mm. Like a manufacturer. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. But it's a benefit see. of COVID. Before COVID, I tried so hard to just work from home. <laughs> <laughs> and I would always have to fly to another state to mm. get the good work. Mm. But after, and since and after COVID, they just want you to be at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think COVID really changes a lot. Mm. <laughs> now, Ken, would you be angry if somebody snatched that away from you? Not at all. You know about the story, yeah? When Debung Monastery was first set up, so normally, at, uh, what happened was not normally. What happened was at that time, there were only seven monks when they first started, right. and uh, at the door they tried to kind of you know close the door before opening. There were monks there struggling, and there's only seven monks. But I think there were one got injured and all this in this. It's not really a uh, stampede, but something similar happened there. And that was considered a, such a auspicious sign that monastery is going to flourish with monks. And from that seven monks, Debung is known to be 7,700 monks. Mm. So till now, now, yeah, the, of course, the seniors can go in first, but those there are a certain uh, class beyond that, below that class, you cannot just go in first. You have to wait to be let in, and then at the door they will always Gigui will close. Gigui is the disciplinary close, and then they will try to push the <laughs> door. It's still happening. <laughs> yeah, just to preserve that tradition. Mm. Yeah, so it was a bit heavy, isn't it, today? <laughs> so anyway, coming back to Ken's uh, question, yeah, it is not something you alone are experiencing. I think this is a, a kind of a many people go through. But that again boils down to not being hasty in establishing the relationship. That's why you really need to check the person, investigate the person. Only when you feel that it's a qualified. So whoever you are pointing to, maybe they are not qualified as they seem. So that's why we really need to find someone qualified. You need to look for these qualities. So you go back home, go through the lamrim, what are the... Uh, defining characteristics. There are eight, I think. If not, it says at this time, it, it is very rare. It is hard to find a person who has all that eight qualities. But then they have given alternatives. At least you need to have this minimum four qualities. So that's why people, we have all this problems and issues, controversial con controversy, whether they have these qualities or not. So that's why it's emphasized again and again that you must not be too quick in establishing the relationship. That's why there's a story about, I think it's a Potowa is another Katamba master and Sangbupa another Katamba master. So their approach approach to guru devotion is different. I think I don't I forget which one is which. One of them who goes to every teaching. If there's any teaching, he sits. 
and research teaching. And then there's uh, another, I don't know which one is which, but other one, the Potowa or the Sambuwa, he only uh, list, attend teaching selectively. So uh, the, uh, there was a discussion, so whose approach is the best approach? You know, taking everybody as your guru or being very selective about. So it's just that when you are in the beginner's level, the other one who is very selective, try to minimize attending teachings. He says that is the best approach. But once you have arrived at a certain level, while well, your uh, realization has uh, what do you call achieved a certain level where you have no problem, then yeah, you can take anybody as your teacher. So that's the uh, uh, what do you call conclusion from this. So for us beginners, we have to be very careful. So once we have established that relationship, no matter whatever happens, we must not criticize. We need to find a way to reframe or find a new narrative. In America, some of the news stations are very good at creating narratives, isn't it? We know. <laughs> we be surprised that how <laughs> this is something that they can really come up with a completely a new version. So we need to resort to this so that you are not affected. So that's why the most important is be careful before you establish. Once established, then be steady. No, what do you call the feeble, what do you call that? Uh, what is the word when, when you change? Flick, fickle minded, fickle minded. Mm. Don't be fickle. fickle, yeah. Tibetan way of saying, Tarjo Lungbu Kajap. You know the brave flex. How brave flex is where the wind is coming. So we should not be like prayer flex. We should be, you know, as rock as Mount Meru when it comes to our faith and devotion. Okay, enough of that. So now we will dive into the actual one. So today what we are discussing is there are many Guru Yoga, but today we are discussing about Guru Yoga based on Nama Tsongkhapa. So even when it comes to Hey, this you shouldn't be seeing this, then no fun. <laughs> Isn't it? Okay. <laughs> now that 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 is already gone. That <laughs> so there are three popular or renowned uh Lama Tsongkhapa, what do you call it? Guru Yoga based on Lama Tsongkhapa. The first one is called uh the Seju, because it's based on different lineage. So you have this Seju lineage, so which is the lineage that is known as Seju is what we are going to discuss. It's called Kandin Lajama. And then we have Wensan Yingyu, there's another lineage, which is also Guru Yoga based on Lama Tsongkhapa. That is the Lama Chuba. We all know Lama Chuba. We all do Lama Chuba practice. And then there was something else, which called Ketub Chigyu, which is uh, what you call the pass down from Ketub Jay, the two disciples. One of them is Ketub Jay. So this one, it looks like at the moment, the lineage is kind of broken, because this one based on the realization is based on the instructions of view, you know, emptiness. So that one is now I think we don't have that lineage. So now the lineage, when we talk about the lineage of this Segu, so how did it come about is of course it has to come from Lama Tsongkhapa. So Lama Tsongkhapa gave these uh, instructions. And then who did Lama Tsongkhapa give this instruction is to Chizun Shirab Senge. 
one who is known to have established or built the Gyume Tantric Monastery. So from Jesuit of Senge, it was passed down to his student, Dunaba Pandin Senge. Hey, it's Pandin. Dunaba Pandin Sangbo. Sorry, Pandin Sangbo, not Senge. Dunaba Pandin Sangbo. And then from there, it passed on, passed on. So there are two versions. One say that Duna Pandeba is the one who composed this Kanten Lajama, uh, that text. There, there's another version, there's somebody else. So anyway, until here, nothing was written. It's all through verbal, it was passed on through verb verbally. And then Duna Pandeba uh, composed that Kanten Lajama. And then from there, the lineage was passed on until to your guru. I received the instruction on this from His Holiness as well as I think the Maloji Rinpoche. So that's that's how it comes comes down. So there there must be a lineage. So that's what we are going to discuss. So now. So now we need to talk about the benefits of Lama Tsongkhapa Guru Yoga. So we, we talked, we already discussed a little bit about, you know, the benefit of generally the Guru Yoga. So Guru Yoga, with, through Guru Yoga practice, we, we will be able to uh, basically achieve almost everything from this life's happiness to the uh, long-term goal, which is the nirvana or enlightenment. And there is a rationale behind that, because they say that your guru, if you are able to do any practice in relation to your guru, it is uh, uh, so powerful. So if that is the case, then whatever we engage, whatever practice we do, especially purification practice, that will become very powerful. And because of that, we will be able to exhaust or purify our negativities, which are the hindrance in our attaining any realizations. And not only that, when we do any practice, we need to have support of our merit. Sometimes we see that people they put so much effort, like business deals. Some people work so hard, like day and night, but at the end of the day, there's nothing much to show. And some even fail, go bankruptcy. Whereas there are people who don't do much, don't, uh, what do you call it, who don't put too much effort. But whatever it is, it's just, uh, what do you call it? The result is different. Everything, whatever the person wishes, is get fulfilled. So that is because the one person, the only difference is one is more meritorious than the other. When you have lots of merits, then yeah, everything becomes successful. You will achieve your goal. There's no hindrance. So we need both purification as well as merit. So the most powerful way to cultivate merit is also through Guru Yoga practice. So in that context, from that point of view, you can understand why Guru Yoga can be a source of all accomplishments, source of all joy and happiness. And also, And also Guru Yoga, especially Lama Tsongkhapa Guru Yoga, is very effective in uh, uh, protecting us from external harm, harms. In, I don't know in the West, but in uh, Tibet and Asian countries, there are what we call spirit harms. People can be possessed. But here in psychology, they don't uh, accept that. But in the, of course, in the West, you have this uh, exorcism, isn't it? Where they 
try to expel the demon out of you. So there are instances, cases where people are possessed. Wait, huh? I don't want this white red light. Okay. So people are possessed by spirits. So it, this the Lama Tsongkhapa's one, especially doing the Lama Tsongkhapa Guru Yoga practice and then reciting, let's say, reciting the Mixima uh, through Gandhin Hajima or Guru Yoga, Lama Tsongkhapa's Guru Yoga is said to be the, what do you call, the best protector, protection for uh, from spirit uh, disturbances. It looks like people are having difficulty seeing. Uh, I hope you are able to uh, watch or listen. Is live? Okay. Because it says a waffling or something. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Okay, so there was this story that uh, one time in Tibetan, one of the Tibetan village, there was a, of course, there's a rich family, and his son was possessed by a, a spirit. And no matter whatever uh, remedy they did, yeah, that 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 spirit was not leaving the son alone. So after uh, after trying everything, there was no real cure. So one of the shepherd or the cowherd, he said, "Oh, you know, when I go to herd my cows in the forest up in the cave, I see there is a one retreater there." So maybe you can approach him. So that happened to be that Dunagba, Pandin Sangbo. We saw at the lineage, he was doing meditation there. So he was approached and uh, uh, asked for his help. But first he said, that, no, no, I cannot do anything. I cannot help. But then after they uh, insisted, and he said, okay, let me just uh, give it a try. First, before I come, let's just see whether I can be any help or not. So you just bring my sh shoes. So the Dunaba Pandi Sam Dunaba gave the family or sent them his one pair, or his, what do you call? His shoes, a pair of shoes, and then one bead from his mala and instructed them to keep the shoes hanging from the ceiling and then put the bead, the mala bead, just one bead, you call bead, is it? That one, put on the window. And then I will see whether I will be able to help or not, whether I will be able to subdue that. So when they Put uh, hang up the shoes, and then put the bit. That boy who's possessed started to scream, saying, "Oh, I'm being buried or pushed down by a mountain, and I cannot run away because the door at the door or the window there, I see those uh, uh, wrathful deities standing guard. Please help me!" And he was screaming and crying and all this. So they went up to inform, and then, you know, okay. Then he thought, okay, it's like he cannot subdue. So Lama came down and subdued and made that spirit promise that he will never hurt anybody in the area where Mixima is known. So the, he said that, Please be mercy on me. Please be compassionate. Because they were talking about Tibet. He says there's no place where Mixima is not uh, flourished. 
everywhere in Tibet, everywhere people know about Mikzima. Said that, you know, then I cannot survive. I still need to live. Be compassion to me as well. Okay, then Lama said, okay, in that case, says that. Whoever or wherever, whoever is more like, whoever recites Mikzima with the Guru Yoga, Lama Tsongkhapa Guru Yoga, Kandin Lajama, you are not to touch them. And he promised. And since then, it is known that if you recite the Mikzima with Gandhin Lajama or Gandhin Lajama Guru Yoga with the Gandhin, what do you call it? Gandhin Lajama Guru Yoga, if you do that practice, you will be protected. You will be never uh, harmed by any spirits. So that's why when I was in school, I have a mala and I would feverishly, is it? Recite Mikzima and then yeah, wear it. Because in school we were young and we would, there, were, there were rumors about ghosts here and there. So from my home, we have we are all put into these different homes. So my home to class, school, whatever classrooms is quite far. And uh, if we don't have to stay behind to clean and all this, it's okay. There's always a group of, you know, uh, students going back. But sometimes what happens is your class will be the one to stay behind and clean all this thing. And then you are only one in the classroom, so you have to walk back alone. So I used to, yeah, chant this and then, yeah, that gives me the comfort. And I don't know whether it worked or not. I wasn't. <laughs> I haven't encountered any ghost. <laughs> so that's that's one of the benefits. So if you are afraid, if you have to, of course here yeah that there are no places, but in some areas there are well known facts, facts, isn't it? Or oh, this curve or that road, there always happens some accidents. And people report about seeing this and that. So in such cases, you can do that. Of course, that is a really worldly things to use Lama Tsongkhapa Guru Yoga. But at least, I'm saying that at least, if you are not, you know, inspired to do the actual uh, practice for the bigger purposes, at least you can use that. So at least you're attending this class will serve that much purpose. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So yeah, I think. So now, about who is Lama Tsongkhapa? So I think you are well aware that there is a book by Kishitubdin Jimbaya. I forget the name of that. Do you remember? Uh, what was that called? Buddha in the Land of Snow or something. That is written mainly for the. Uh, Non, non Tibetan readers. So it is written because in Tibetan version there are so many things that like it is hard to digest for non Tibetans, but he has kind of diluted, I would say, a bit <laughs> in that sense, made it readable, made it fathomable for people like, okay, that is possible, that is possible. But some of the things you really need. Uh, huge amount of faith in order to really <laughs> digest the story. But of course it's not that is not accurate or not true, but it is. But he, so there's this book, you can uh, look out for that. So anyway, Lama Tsongkhapa is commonly uh, accepted as the manifestation of Manjushri, Manjushri himself. So there are many references to Lama Tsongkhapa in Sutra. Just to give an example, I have brought here too. He says in the Sutra, this is Lord Buddha saying, yeah, Shajimuni Buddha saying that after I have passed away, you will, in the form of a child, perform the actions of Buddha. And there are more to it. It lists uh, his names and uh, the Gandhian monastery is also listed and how he will. Uh, help sentient beings and spread 
Buddha Dharma. So this is mentioned. It says this is Manjushri is talking to Manjushri at that time. Manjushri, when I pass away, in certain after certain years, you will be born. As a child here is ordinary. We're not saying just child. Saying ordinary person. So at that time, Manjushri is already up there, the realized being. But you will appear or come as an ordinary being to help spread Dharma and to benefit sentient beings. So that is mentioned in Manjushri root text. Mm. And I think this is from uh, the predictions from uh, Padmasambhava, if I'm not mistaken. A manifestation of Manjushri, the holder of the teachings, who will reveal the teaching to those who are to be subdued. Lobsan Thapa. So he has mentioned the name. Lobsan Thapa, holder of the sutra and tantra teachings, will appear. So there is no refute. Uh, there is no, no refutation, is it? Uh, There's no refutation to the fact, is it? To the fact that Lama Tsongkhapa is the holder of Sutra and Tantra teaching. So, what is after this? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, Lama Tsongkhapa, in terms of his scholarly and his realization. So there are many books written, many praise written about him. So of course we can kind of take with a, what you call pinch of salt that oh maybe this is this or oh, it's just poetry this and this. But this is what Lama Tsongkhapa himself composed. He composed about what is called the destiny fulfilled. It's basically he is just uh, rejoicing. Because it says that in the beginning, it says that Buddhas have uh, said that rejoicing is the best way to create merit. So Lama Tsongkhapa was listening, listing all his accomplishments and then rejoicing his own virtue. So when it comes to the, uh, just to summarize his life, this is what Lama Tsongkhapa himself mentioned. So we don't need to take all this with a pinch of salt is just Lama Tsongkhapa. He's saying that these are what I did. In the beginning, I sought out extensive learning. I think there was, we can say with certainty that there was no scholar in Tibet before Lama Tsongkhapa that who has studied extensively, that, that extensively. Lama Tsongkhapa is known to have studied almost every Indian scholar's writing. Because at that time, Tibet, there are so many contradictions. Those who are, well, there was time where Tandra is also prevailing, and somehow there's this contradiction that if you practice Tandra, Sutra, you can just ignore, it's not important. Especially Vinaya, not important. You can just ignore them. You can do all kinds of things. You can drink, you can get married, all these things, as long as you practice Tandra. They have this view. And then on the other hand, the old tantra is not a good practice. You have to really follow strictly the Vinaya. So there are so many these things. So Lama Tsongkhapa really, in today's term, research what the Buddhas taught and what the, those great scholars, Indian scholars, have written about. So he really did intensive research and studied each and every uh, text available. And then he made the conclusion. So just to give you an example, there was in the biography, it says that Lama Tsongkhapa, the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra, which in monastery we study for seven years. And he said Lama Tsongkhapa, when he was young, he started this and he, what do you call, uh, he mastered the subject in 28 days. So just to give you an idea, if Lama Tsongkhapa has that kind of uh, intelligence, that kind of powerful intelligence, and 
if he has studied for even for ten years, how much can he learn? But Lama Tsongkhapa has studied over thirty-three years. So now imagine, with that kind of intelligence, somebody with that kind of intelligence, studying for thirty over years. Wow. If some, if there's a there's a technology to really scan the brain, I think it would be like unbelievable. Even for us, our capacity of absorbing is so low. Even if we study like monastery, we study for thirty years for even like wow, we just like you know, we are surprised by ourselves. <laughs> But then look at Lama Tsongkhapa. So this is in the beginning. I sought out extensive learning, but he didn't leave it there. In the middle, all the scriptures dawn on me as instructions. He didn't leave whatever he studied. He didn't leave it as intellectual knowledge. He really contemplated on it, and then he realized that all these have connections. All these can be used for one person to achieve enlightenment. For us, we read on. Refuge, okay, one discrete, separate thing. We read on karma, we put in another box. We read on patience, we put another. We don't find that nexus or that connection. But Namo Tsongkhapa, whatever he reads, all、oh, this is also for one's practice. This is also for can find that connection. It says everything, even one stanza, he can link it. He can find or use it for one's、uh, development. There's all connect connected. We don't see that, isn't it? We are like, I think they said that、uh, people with the,、uh, uh, what is that one? Ayo, what is that disorder? One who can only see specific things. Autism, yeah. People with autism, some of those、uh, people with autism, we were warned not to say autistic person. People with autism, because then it's like we lump everything. <laughs> there. Yeah, people with autism, people with depression. So, people with autism, they have a different perception. So that's why some of them can really draw well. So much detail because they see only separate things. They have difficulty putting everything seeing as whole. So when it comes to dharma, all these things, I think we are like having autism, isn't it? We see everything separate, separate. We fail to see that holistically. So Lama Tsongkhapa's case, he was able to realize all this, and then in the end, I practice all day and all night. We just <laughs> live here, isn't it? In the classroom, we warm the cushion. <laughs> ah, very good. Ah, wow, yeah, that's really. And then, especially when Lama is talking about, you're not thinking of yourself. You say, oh yeah, I know. He's talking about this person, that person. You have all the examples of another person except you, isn't it? Oh, that I know exactly. I know that person is there. Is there? Is not you? And then you just. Warm up the cushion, go back home. Nice, all this thing finished. But Lama Tsongkhapa, he really, really practiced. I think we can say that not even one day. And you know, in the, the Sadhana, in in his biography, he says that from four year or seven year, he has started doing sadhanas of I know those highest yoga tantra. Wow. What time we did it? When at seven years old, we will be really with all this <laughs> absorbed with all this. What do you call this、uh, toy thing and all that? Of course, those days no Barbie doll, isn't it? Oh, no, <laughs> bring bringing our house, all this thing. But Lama Tsongkhapa is doing all this highest yoga <laughs> tantra practices at the age of seven. And then Lama Tsongkhapa at that time. He was very popular. He has so many disciples, but still he hasn't really 
uh, what do you call that, grabs the final, final detail of emptiness. So that's why he was trying and asked uh, Manjushri, and that's the Manjushri instruction that I showed you. So when Manjushri gave instruction, Lama Tsongkhapa left everything. Even though there are so many disciples waiting on followers there, he left everything, took with him some uh, what are called special connected students, and went into retreat in a harsh, in a cave there, and did prostrations. It says that they're all the flesh wall, what do you call, kind of a wear, wear and tear. And then did mandala. Mandala, Lama Tsongkhapa didn't have the mandala set. No golden, no silver mandala. Just used the flat piece of rock. Did that and all this, but continue. And then the foot there is very samba and whatever it is. But still, after that, because he did so much purification, then he was able to really see the emptiness as it is. So, like Lama Tsongkhapa, who has done so much extensive learning, so much contemplation, so or practice all day and night, had to go to do purification. Then, not to mention about us, <laughs> isn't it? We think that we did 100 prostrations. Oh, I have done so much purification. There, <laughs> isn't it? So this, yeah, it's good to read the biography of these great beings. Then we get inspired. Then in their comparison in them, it's like, oh, why are we complaining? <laughs> you know? There's no reason to complain. And then dedicated it all for the teachings to flourish. Whatever he did, it is for the benefit of sentient beings. It is for the benefit of uh, uh, what you call a flourishing the Buddha Dharma. So that's Lama Tsongkhapa. When he was first, uh, what do you call, rising kind of a scholar, there were so many people challenging him. Even from the well-known is uh, uh, from one great scholar from Sakya. He was always criticizing him, always challenging him. And then eventually, he also composed so many praise. Because what happened was, when Lama Tsongkhapa composed that uh, praise to Buddha in teaching uh, dependent arising, that one. So Tibetan writings, if you look, the author's name is not in the beginning. You will only see the title. And then other one is all the way down. From here also you can see the, you know, always want to downplay. There's no much ego, no show of. In the West, when we publish a book, the first thing on the front page is doctor something, something, isn't it? Big name there. But the uh, Tibetan way of composing those lamas, they don't do that. So that's why, and also the great scholars, they don't look at who is the writer, who is the author. So they just read. So when this Sajja, this great scholar, when he uh, came across this Lama Tsongkhapa's composition on that, so he read, first he thought, hey, this must be a writing by Nagarjuna himself. And then it, is, it talks about from the Nagarjuna's uh, teaching, Oh, it's not Nagarjuna because it mentions about Nagarjuna. He was so impressed, so impressed, and then finally he saw that it was Lama Tsongkhapa. That's the one. Then he started to compose praise. That he really saw him as the scholar. So they are not biased, you see, they are not partisan. So they really, yeah, if you see the quality, then they will. Because that is when Lama Tsongkhapa has finally uh, gain the realization of the true nature of emptiness, true nature of things. Earlier ones, he was not there yet. So now when he has that realization and when he composed, that really, uh, uh, what do you call, the captivated 
other scholars. And that's how they wrote. Oh, it's already 12. Mm. OK, so that's about Lama Tsongkhapa story. Oh, right. Great, it says. OK, yeah, lunchtime. OK, let's uh, stop here. Pidi Jose Medo Dama Reja Lenje Nyende Gamba de Sanje Shindo Migdem Bilai Dogun Namda Jela Jabara Sho Guru Rana Mandala Gana Yataya Me Rimbo Je Maje Pana Je Joje Jeba Nyamba Mebaya Kone Gondo Bewara Sho Kuzi Rab Denje, Namgara Tele, Chojo Yavata, Bazan Tembe, Dreme Zazumje, Jove Muse Dato Ne Joroche, Kurve Shengam So, Pendan Dewa Malu Jungwe Ne, Chenre Sengwan Tenzin Yazoi, Jabe Zede Bato Ten Joroche, Jedara Gemba da Kundo Zambo Dayan de Gendo, Teda Kungi Jazo Daloji, Gawa de da Damje Radongo, Tuzon Jebe Gawa Tamje Ge, Gawa Gala Jodonga, Dagi Gewe Zawan de Gunja, Zambo Chuji Radongo Varagi. Okay, thank you.